We are committed to creating a safe and supportive space for our guests and listeners, and to provide information and tools that will help our listeners understand, manage, and overcome trauma. We understand that the healing journey can bring up challenging emotions. Therefore, we want to warn our audience that certain episodes may contain discussions or stories that could be triggering for some individuals. The content of the podcast is for educational and informative purposes only, and we encourage you to practice self-care and discretion while listening, and to reach out to a trusted support system or professional if you feel overwhelmed and need help on your healing journey. So welcome back to Healing and Growing Hand in Hand podcast. I'm your host, Lisa Tickle, and our guest today is Danielle Dupre. And she is a holistic doc neuromind coach. And I'm sure you're going to tell us more about that, which is really interesting. And the biggest subject we're going to talk about today is legal abuse. Um, that's going to be a big subject. And so welcome, Danielle, and thank you for, for being here today. Well, thank you for inviting me. I'm looking forward to it. I am too. So tell us about you and tell us about, what is it, holistic doc neuromind coach. Yeah, well, uh, first my accent. I grew up in the French part of Switzerland. I practiced uh, English in India. And for some reason, my accent got mixed up between French and Indian. (laughs) So people don't listen to me until they figure out, is she from Ukraine? Is she from Germany? (laughs) Then no, French with an Indian accent in it. (laughs) Oh, that's funny. That's cute. (laughs) So anyway, I, I, you know, I grew up I, uh, until I was 24. Then uh, I also traveled through Europe, the Middle East, parts of Asia, came to this country, the U.S. in 1979. I was just going to you know, cross over the U.S. and continue going around the world. And I got married, had children, got divorced. And uh, yeah, so I studied different things. I uh, was very interested in becoming a doctor. I wanted to be a neurosurgeon. And uh, mm. my parents couldn't afford the studies. So I went into psychology. At 15, I had uh, skin cancer. I was diagnosed with skin cancer surgery every six months. Ooh. And the, uh, the Institute of Psychology I was studying was in Paris, also was teaching about nutrition. So they said, you know, why don't you check that out? And I did. I bought my first juicer when I was 18 and did a deep cleanse and never went back to the surgeon for skin cancer. So and never had skin cancer were, again. No, and to me, I, I had a lot of toxins because I had had a lot of injections, when, uh, a lot of vaccine when I was a kid, but I still got the disease from the vaccine, uh, you mm. know, that the vaccine was supposed to prevent, and I grew up on antibiotics. Ooh. So I was constantly sick, and I think that's, you know, there's a, there's a connection between toxins and cancer. I think my, uh, my body was trying to get rid of the toxins, I helped it with the nutrition. I already had my life planned, so I didn't have to do much in a way of mental or emotional. But cancer Mm -hmm. is tricky. You can have like, you know, some people have to change 98% of their life to heal a cancer. There's a lot of emotion and trauma. That was not my problem. My problem was just getting rid of toxins. It, you know, then, it kind of makes sense though, because I had recently heard that, you know, the liver is, is our fil- you know, filtration system. And if you can keep your liver healthy and, you know, keeping it clean, cancer cannot attach. So it kind of makes sense. Like what you're saying that, you know, you did a cleanse and you, so you cleansed your liver along with it and therefore the can the cancer was no more. Yep. So I say cancer is very tricky. Sometimes People get cancer because they're not following their life path. And the cancer is kind of a wake-up call. You know, we don't listen, we don't listen, and all of a sudden we diagnose with a catastrophic illness. Say, ooh, you know, where'd that come from? Yeah, it gets your attention. So, yes, and, uh, you know, I hadn't planned on having children, and I got seven, and I loved it, actually. I became a professional mother. I hope (laughs) my kids, I home birthed them. But was not very happy. It was not a happy marriage, and it was kind of in a cult. And when I divorced, then everything went um, sideways. That was uh, the legal abuse that I got trapped in for many years. So I had a background in uh, nutrition, had a background in psychology. And now I say, and, you know, I still do uh, neurosurgery, but without a scalpel. I help mm-hmm. people change their mind their mindset without the the scalpel, just doing psychology, NLP, hypnosis, different things. Mm -hmm. Different modalities. 
I had yeah different modalities that I learned and that I learned after going through the legal abuse that left me with complex PTSD and uh, they call anhedonia where all my feelings and sensation and emotions flatlined. And I was told I would have to learn to live like that and I didn't like that. So I learned even more modalities and pulled myself out. That's why I can now help people who have gone through kind of extensive trauma. Mm -hmm. They call that post-traumatic growth. That's what I understand. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So you're helping others, which is beautiful. So tell us a little bit about your journey with the legal abuse and the system. Because I, I, I used to work in the legal system, actually. I worked in law firms for years. Um, and it was it was not this type of law that we're kind of getting into. But, I mean, I can see there's, you know, what I, what I, what frustrated me about the, the legal system is there's so much gray area. Yeah. Yeah. I used to work for a legal firm when I was in Switzerland. Mm. And... Uh, I mean, somebody sent a letter, uh, an attorney sent you a letter, you had 10 days to respond, and there was kind of a rules, you know, you follow the rules. And I found out when I started, I expected the same thing. There was no rules. It seems every court, the the judge in every court decides what he wants for Mm -hmm. rules. So I was kind of foolish of uh, my part to expect a nice divorce, didn't happen. And there was a lot of abuse during the marriage, abuse with the children. And when I went to court, the father had hardly ever taken care of the children. And uh, we went to court and I thought I was going to get custody because the children lived with me. I homeschooled them. And then he got custody and the whole battle started. So the judge How, how did the care. judge justify that? How did the judge justify the children had lived with you and well, both of you, but you were the one, the, the primary caretaker. How did he justify that he I could get the children? The judge, there is what they call a cottage industry in family court where, you know, psychologists decided, well, a judge does not understand the psyche, the what's going on. We're going to tell the judge, you know, how he should do the, the custody. So you have all kind of psychologists now that work for the court and kind of uh, they've been brainwashed a lot by different uh, sides. And depending which side the judge is on, then they, you know, the yeah. judge generally wants to do 50-50 custody. But it doesn't work where you have one parent that's abusive. That's, you know, I learned later yeah. on my ex was a pedophile. Why oh, would you God. give custody to a pedophile? So, <laughs> you know, uh, his... Uh, Father, sister wrote a letter to the judge, said, don't give custody to my brother. He raped me for eight years and molested my daughter. And six weeks later, he had full custody of the children. And uh, I had supervised visitation, which he he had to set them up. He never did. I didn't see my children for two years. Oh, God, that's got to be. I just can't imagine. Everywhere in family court, the statistic I heard is there are 58,000 children a year that are being put uh, with an abusive parent. There's about oh, one who is murdered every 10 days. It makes a whole system work because they know if oh, the, the child, children are put with the abusive parent, the protective parent will keep trying to get custody to protect the children. So you have uh, all kind of psychologists that get involved. You have attorneys that get paid. And it makes, it's like a 30, I forgot if it's million or billion dollar business. Yeah. 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 By the time you pull in all the experts, I mean, that is one thing. If you can at all avoid it, not going through the court system with your children because of that very thing, all of a sudden, all these other people have the say in what your, where your children go and what's happening with your children. All of a sudden you don't have, you can say whatever you want, but they're making the, the final decision. That's frightening. Yeah. You know, and I thought I had prepared all the paper. I thought my ex was going to agree just to sign. We're going to divide things. We still were, uh, you know, he came for Christmas, for birthday. I was still cutting his hair. And uh, so I filed for divorce. It took him a long time. Uh, Just looking at the papers, he went behind my back and hired a powerful attorney. And the attorney said, we're going to accuse her of parental alienation. So instead of going to visit, 
you know, you just say that uh, she's not allowing you to see the children. And that's what he did. He wouldn't come. You know, we, we decided he would come and, and eat dinner with us. And he wouldn't come. He wouldn't come. And then he told the judge, well, she's, uh, you know, she's alienating the children. And then I was punished for that. They took the children away. And I had never been without my children. We spent all our time together. I was homeschooling seven children. So we were always together. Oh my and gosh. it was horrible when they took the children away. I can't even imagine. I can't imagine how that would be at all. And, you know, then we had the psychologist that did the first uh, report. And I'm not exaggerating. There's 13 report, a uh, 13 page report. There is not one paragraph that is correct. It's all twisted. Uh, and the kids and I went camping because the kids asked, if, you know, if we could go camping. I borrowed some material from a friend. We went camping three times. And the last time was in October. It got cold that night. And decided camping season is over. Gave the material back. Her report said seven times I was forcing the children to sleep outside and they were cold. And the whole report was like that. Uh, I had started, my ex decided that it would be better for me to uh, work in San Francisco. I would have more clients. So I started, it was a three and a half hour drive to go there. And then Ooh. I became president of an association there. So he had the kids on uh Every other weekend, and the weekend he didn't have the kids, I was in Marin County networking. But I didn't have clients yet, and my kids came uh, with me. Well, we went camping there, and uh, I went to visit the, the ex-president of the group that I had become president, and she lived beside George Lucas' home. You know, the oh, guy wow. Who made, uh, you know, <clears throat> Star Wars, I yeah, think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My kids were that to say, Mom, we'd like to come with you. So they came, they looked at the house, went back. We had a big van at the time. They played a game while I talked with uh, my friend. And uh, then we went back home. And the report said I was forcing the children to spend all day in the van while seeing my clients. I didn't have any clients. I was just starting there, and they wanted to come and visit the you know, look at George Lucas' home. And one of the sibling was living there. And then we spent time at, the, at one of my colleagues' house. She had canoes and, uh, you know, we went uh, boating. We went to something called Marine World Africa USA. <coughs> I might have to drink something. But the whole thing was twisted. Um, I'm going to ask an obvious question. Is your ex a narcissist? <laughs> He was diagnosed I mean, was, by he, a psychologist, a family therapist, and a psychiatrist as a dangerous psychopath. There you go. There you go. So he was beyond narcissist. Was that was he diagnosed before or after your divorce? No, during the divorce, these people were my colleagues and they came to visit. So I'm going to ask an obvious question. Was your ex diagnosed a narcissist? Because that's narcissistic behavior. Yes, it is. But apparently it went beyond that. I had a psychologist who knew him, a psychotherapist that was a friend that came often, and then a psychiatrist tell me he's a dangerous so uh, psychopath. Yeah. So I was yeah. given, you know, says there's not much we can do to help you right now because you're in the middle of it. But uh, I read a book that they gave me. I forgot the name and then a, a movie to watch. And uh, I think it was called High Crime. And uh, it explained the type of mentality he had. And then I was reading books and it's, it's amazing because I remember being during a trial where he was telling the judge something and they say, well, you know, your honor, this is not what he wrote. And yet, and then he changed, turn a 180, say exactly the opposite. And the judge still bought it. Because apparently uh, psychopaths, sociopaths have that ability to feel what the other person wants. And they just, it's just amazing how they can turn something around. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. My brother is kind of a sociopath and, and narcissistic and, you know, the, both those behaviors. And, and, and I don't know how they 
they're able to convince everybody else that you're the bad guy. And I don't know how they can do that. They, yeah. they, I, I know in a nar and I experienced a narcissistic relationship and, and it's, it's, it's a, it's an art. It really is that they're able to convince people and you're standing there going, why can't you people see the, this truth? The facts. Like, yeah, try. the facts. Cause I actually had a very dear friend who a couple of years ago went through a lawsuit with her narcissistic ex-boyfriend and he, the things that he convinced that judge of that was so obvious and she ended up losing, even though there was clear evidence of what he was doing. It is so bizarre. I don't understand that at all, but your ex-husband was able to do that. Yep. Yeah. And I had read about it and then I just witnessed it in court. It's just amazing. And then my children ran away twice. Uh, well, I learned, I, I got a copy of the letter that my sister-in-law whom i hardly talked to that you know telling the judge don't give the uh the children to him he raped me for eight years i read that letter in the evening and we were supposed to go to court the next day my daughter was i was driving but my heart went into fibrillation so she drove me to the hospital she saw me in a you know hospital connected to all kind of stuff and uh she said mom i'm gonna take the kids away i'm gonna protect them and uh, she was 17. She said, you know, I bought that car with a big trunk. I'm going to take the little ones and mm. I'm going to, I'm going to raise them. And she did. She went, uh, you know, from California to Colorado. I don't know where she went at this, you know, she had found someplace. She knew that uh, she could be tracked with her cell phone. So she would not, she would go to a cabin, call somebody who called somebody who then called me saying, you know, your children, they're doing fine. Mm -hmm. and uh and then another of the the father's sister intervened she had quite a bit of money said we're going to protect the kids let them come to florida uh you know the court's not going to take them i'm going to protect them because i know what happened to my sister and then i was talking to the da and he said yeah there is no way we're going to give him custody so i let you know i told the children and she paid for the the flight to florida when they arrived the father was there and got full custody so they went back with the father oh my god what what ha wait what happened didn't they didn't the da say he wouldn't do that that's right he said that oh my god so they went back to the father and i wasn't allowed to see my children and uh then the father accused one of my daughters to have stolen her aunt's purse. And I wasn't there. It was a big discussion. She took a knife. She was afraid. Oh, she God. called the cops and says, you know, I'm afraid of my dad. So the cops came. They handcuffed her and put her in a police car. And she was driven to a mental hospital. Oh, my God. And uh, she never took any of the medication because she told the doctor, I don't need medication. It's not me. It's crazy. It's not me. And then he was threatening to put my youngest daughter also in there if she didn't behave. Anyway, they went back and they were constantly under the threat of going back to a mental hospital. So they managed to run away again. At the time, I was living in uh, Las Vegas with my two oldest daughter. We had gone to see an attorney. And the attorney said, the children cannot come to you because they're going to jail you. So mm -hmm. let's get uh, a protective order. So the children run away again from California to Las Vegas, went with my oldest daughter to see the attorney. They asked for protective order. They didn't get them. And it was like four months later, the, uh, the U.S. Marshal surrounded our house, arrested my oldest daughter and myself. My oldest daughter spent four days in jail. She had to decide whether she was going to stay in jail to pay for her father's attorney fee or just work and pay for the, her father's attorney fees. She then, you know, took four jobs and uh, in Las Vegas, she didn't even have a car at the time. She was rollerblading from one job to another, sleeping on a bench when she could, so she could afford, you know, to pay her father's attorney fees. I spent six months in maximum security with murderers and drug dealers. They accused us of having kidnapped the children. We're 500 miles away. The children ran away. They had a, a driver's license. They had a vehicle. People had helped them. 
but we were accused of uh, kidnapping the children. I still have a record as a felon for child stealing. So I spent six months in uh, in jail, and then when I went out, Karen Huffer, who wrote the book Legal Abuse Syndrome, contacted me. And then we worked together. We had a support group for people going through protracted litigation. And it was not only family court. There was a lot of abuse also in probate court, elder abuse, wrongful termination, HOA. So every week we would help people with different modalities, different techniques, so they could keep their head above water and once it's over and help them recover. But uh, Karen Huffer, she passed away a few years ago. She was a marriage and family therapist and became a forensic psychologist. She saw that her clients were doing fine until they went to court. And then she had to start the therapy over. Mm -hmm. and she studied that for like 20 years. And then where she coined that term legal abuse syndrome. Yeah, and to her, to her, it's a subset of PTSD. Mm -hmm. She wanted to have it in a DSM five, but she uh, she passed away before. So it it really should, because honestly, the things I've experienced and the things that I've witnessed, there is a lot of that, a, a lot of legal abuse that goes on, and and it, and it is it is traumatic to go through any kind of lawsuit. I mean, even if you go to small claims, I mean, that's not, it, it's scary. I've done it myself, yeah, but when you yeah. get into a full on lawsuit, um, you know, and the, one of the things the attorneys I used to work for would, uh, would do, and they would sit down with their client and tell them mentally what you're going to go through. Cause people don't think about that. They don't think about the mental side of going through a lawsuit. And even though you may be a hundred percent, right, you're going to be dragged through the mud and there's going to be, your life is going to be put on that in that courtroom and, and every step of the way is, is stressful. It's not just stressful in trial. So it may take you two years to get to trial and it's scary. Yeah. And then, you know, you're supposed to go to a, to a trial or to a, what is an audition, something. And uh, then it's reported and reported. And, you know, there's always something or some, you know, the secretary of the attorney would call and say, Oh, uh, do you know, we're going to court tomorrow. Uh, no and you know it was an hour drive to go there and then i was in las vegas and the court continued in uh in sonora so i had to drive 500 miles they refused to let me appear on uh, on zoom or whatever i had to drive once a month to go there to to be in court and then i became an, uh, an ada advocate so i could help people who had uh, you know some kind of handicap is either uh, physical or especially mental yeah. but i don't do that any longer because there's so much corruption there is no way to get justice the last time i was with a woman here in colorado was a few years ago and she had she had three daughters 9 11 and 13 i didn't know much of the case because i was just pushed in court because the, the previous uh, ADA advocate was kicked out by the judge illegally. So I was pushing court, say, you're an ADA advocate, go help her. And first, the, the was a divorce and custody. He had three attorneys that grilled me to know, you know who I was, where I stood, and which is illegal. They're not allowed to do that with an ADA advocate. And um, then I'm supposed to, st uh, to be seated beside my client. Mm-hmm. And you have the, the defendant, and um, I forgot the other one. Usually they separated. But there she was right there, and her husband was behind her, breathing in her neck with two attorneys beside. And she had a panic attack. The judge ordered her to stop the panic attack. Well, she couldn't. So, you know, we were able to go outside, but I was not allowed to be beside her to monitor her. And for nine hours, it was like an inquisition court. They just accused her of one thing after another. Now, she had found, I think, the journal of the 13-year-old was talking about how the kids were molested and abused. And it was horrible. But she was not allowed to talk about that. And uh, then uh, during the evening, she had another panic attack. She went to the hospital. The next morning, she was still in the hospital, so I went to court, told the judge, uh, she's in the hospital. Obviously, she's not going to be able to stand trial. The judge said, well, I'll decide whether I'm going to continue or not. So I went to the hospital to pick up my clients. During that time, the judge, re uh, uh, well, she lost her parental rights. 
she's not allowed to see her children till they're 18. Oh my God. And she spent one year in jail for not immediately obeying a court order. She had, I think, like a GoFundMe type thing. She said, you know, her husband had a lot of money. She <laughs> didn't. She didn't give any names or anything. She just explained, you know, my children are being molested. I'm trying to fight for them. And uh, I guess the judge, if I remember well, told her to remove that from Facebook. And she was out in the back country, didn't get the email on time. And she was a few days late and spent a year in jail. Oh, my goodness. And then she had precancerous problem on her skin. The judge decided she didn't have cancer. I had the paper showing that she had PTSD. The judge decided she didn't have PTSD. So I went to the ADA coordinator in the court and did nothing. So I went to the state ADA coordinator. She told me, well, that's a judge's court. She can do what she wants, which is not true because judges are servants of the people. Mm -hmm. So I went to the DOJ because the uh, ADA advocates are supposed to be protected by the DOJ and never got a response. Oh. Do you know what she's doing today? Is Do you know how she's she doing? She is out. She, she went into some religious type nutrition thing. I know. Oh, uh, bless her heart. not in contact anymore. And I don't, you know, I don't do that. What I do is I help people to, right, to keep their head above water during yeah. uh, you know, the trials so they can keep going. And then I help them recover after. But standing in court... To me, it's a waste of time until we change the whole court system. Yeah, it's, it's broken. Make it a human place. It's, you know. It's broken. And when I started the divorce, my neighbors told me, well, you're going to lose everything. You're a woman, you have an accent, and you have two doctorates. The judge is not going to like that. And I laughed, you know, it was 98, 99. I said, this is a 20th century that doesn't happen any longer. And I lost everything. And then I had an attorney, my uncle paid like $1,500 to do a change of venue. Could have mm -hmm. done that you know, myself, it's pretty easy. But anyway, the attorney said, I'm not going to take your money anymore because the judge doesn't like you, you're going to lose. So we're just going to throw the towel in and that's just what you have to live with. Yeah. And then I had, uh, you know, my youngest, my son uh, had problem with allergies. He was not supposed to eat dairy or... Um, wheat products and i mean it's you know the judges didn't know about that but the father fed him some uh, cream cheese and pasta and i guess he had a hot time breathing during the night so the father took him to the to the emergency room said the mother is a naturopath she doesn't want to do anything to help my child uh breathe and they turn the whole thing against me and forced him to have surgery to remove his adenoids which he didn't need to because I went to another doctor, I had all kind of tests done. He did not need a surgery. And they had him go and have surgery that he didn't just to spite me because I was a naturopath. And uh, I had been trained in preparing people before surgery and I was not allowed to be with my son. And after he came out of the hospital, I had neighbors calling and say, your son's not doing good. You need to come get him. So I wasn't allowed to do it. He couldn't? No. So... <sighs> How did you get out of this? How did this thing turn around? How did so for two years you didn't have your children, you spent a year in jail. Yeah, all this, and everything that you tried to do to make it right, the judge ruled against you. Yep, and then I had that intuition. The judge changed, and I made a motion to have custody back. So you changed, and, so change of venue means, it, what it means so the audience understands is that you change judges basically, or, or even change courts. Well, change of venue, we started in Mariposa County and then we both moved to a different county. County, so change yeah. change of venue, you know, I thought maybe starting in another venue. Yep. Yeah. And uh, when the, uh, I was living in Las Vegas, my ex-husband was still in uh, California. I did the change of, uh, I asked for the change of custody to get my kids back. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was a new judge and he said, he listened to the kids and they seem to, you know, want to live with you until he heard from the other judge. But anyway, so I got custody of my kids. My son is a dwarf. Okay. So he have kind of bigger head, but he mm -hmm. was very, very smart. He's one of 
was the best reader I had of all my children. And after, uh, after he got back from the hospital, he had lost the ability to read. We had to start all over. And that happened with anesthesia. Um, but anyway, the father, well, obviously we were not living together. So the father put the kids in a public school and he convinced the, the teachers that he was kind of dumb and retarded. So they put him in special education. So when I got custody back, he was in special ed in sixth grade. He came to Las Vegas. He passed the, the test, the, the state test the following year at the eighth grade level without special ed. He just was given more time to read. And we thought, hey, the judge going to be all happy, right? Should be. You know what the judge said? The state of Nevada must have cheated on the tests. Therefore, the son will come back living with the father. And he spent his two last years, 16, 17, 18 years, with the father. Hardly went to school because he was too dumb, I guess. I went to a parent's, uh, what is it called? Parent's teacher uh, conference. Mm -hmm. And they were talking about a kid that was not my kid. I mean... <laughs> He just couldn't do this. He couldn't do this. He couldn't do that. He spent like half a day a week in school. And then the rest of the time he was isolated in the house watching movies. I was going to say the reason why he was struggling is not because he couldn't do it. It's because of the environment he was living in and that he didn't have the support and the help and he wasn't going to school. That's why he was struggling. You know, in, in the two, in the years that he was with me, he had passed everything. So he did not really need to go to school. I mean, the whole thing was just didn't make any sense. You know, I tried to appeal and then found out the two of the appeals judge were friends with a judge that I had. So obviously it didn't go anywhere. And then uh, they recorded the, the, it's not an audition. I can't even find the, the word when you go to the, to court. The mediation or the, or no, it was not the mediation, just going to court to have a, you know. The trial? Have, the actual trial itself? Well, it's or not the court trial. Hearing? Yeah, the, we had a trial, which was another thing. But no, it was just, we had to go every month to evaluate you know, the situation. Oh. So where was I going with that? Yeah, it was just, I was driving 500 miles. And the judge told the children, okay, I want you to go visit your father. I think it was every other month. If that doesn't work, then you will not have to uh, to come anymore. So at the end of the year, we went back and the judge said, well, actually, we're going to make you go now every month for another year. And then we'll see. So then, yeah, the judge was lying. And then it seemed the judge had problem with his granddaughter who didn't want to go to college. So he went on the whole diatribe about, uh, you know, <laughs> with my daughter, forcing her to go to college. This because is so bizarre. <laughs> I mean, the whole thing just makes no sense. But uh, yeah, I know it to be true because I experienced this not on a not on a trial I was on, but actually a trial I was involved in when I worked at a law firm. And I came into this trial while well, we were getting ready to go to trial, but it had been going on for years. That this lawsuit had just been for years, and it was the judge was doing the same thing. It was. I was sitting there watching his rulings and everything. And, and I had, had been apprised of the, the case and all of the rulings that had happened that were so bizarre that you start to think, is this judge being paid off? Seriously. It was so out there and you're sitting there watching this and there's nothing you can do. It's so bizarre. And, you know, I mean, the, the attorneys even thought for a while that maybe the judge somehow, some way was being paid off by the, by the defendant. It was that crazy. Well, my ex was good. He made friends with policemen and the DA. So eventually he didn't need an attorney uh, any longer. But he had uh, the best attorney or the most crooked one, but who who was getting what his clients wanted. And one time I got a judgment where I had to produce paper from Switzerland. I had had skin cancer and I had to prove I had skin cancer like 30 or 40 years back, like a hospital would keep, you know. And if I didn't produce them by that time, then I would be in contempt of court. So I went to the court 
And I says, you know, I, I got this judgment. There is no way I can abide by that. And uh, the clerk, they looked at it and say, well, yeah, that's a judge's signature, but it's not our stamp. It's the, you know, it's the attorney that stamped that judgment. It was not the judge. Oh. And they say, we're going to go after the attorney. And, you know, they never did. How long ago did all this get resolved? When my kids turned, my last kid turned 18. Which was when? Oh, when did he turn 18? He was born in 94. Okay. And, so uh, it really hasn't been that long in the grand scheme of things, really. No, and I'm still, if you want, suffering. First of all, he got all the IRA, all the money that, uh, you know, the pensions and everything went to him. I got no child support, no uh, family support. And because I had the uh, doctorates, the judge, I never really worked. I was taking care of my kids. Right. I was homeschooling. Uh, we had gardens. I was making their clothes. The judge decided, oh, you have a PhD. So imputed me a $10,000 a month income. Oh, God. That's, <laughs> what, that's what you could possibly make, not what you're making. Right. That's what he's no, saying. No, I wasn't making. And there was, you know, I talked to my colleagues. They weren't making that, especially not in a little place in the Sierra mountains. Okay. So, but, and you know, for the first couple of years, I thought I was losing my mind. And, oh yeah. And then I found you know groups and say, it's not you. Uh, that's a whole system. And I started to attend different conference. There's hundreds upon hundreds of cases like that. Thousands. Mm -hmm. There is 58,000 kids that are being put with the, the wrong, you know, the, the abusive parent. And some are being murdered, some are committing suicide, and and then it's traumatic. I still I'm still a felon for child stealing. Who wants to hire somebody that has stolen children? You that know, sounds horrible. Running away. Yeah, you know I can't even do go to a rental because they want your criminal record. My criminal record said child stealing or child kidnapping. So, yeah, it's, you know, it's not easy. Many, many women just don't make it back. You know, I'm fortunate I have children mm -hmm. that have been helping me, but it's been a tough road. But yeah, in some I, way, then I can help people. Yeah. And I mean, the system is definitely broken. That and the foster system. They're both very, very, no, very broken. Yeah. Very broken. And, and, you know, you went through a lot. I can't imagine what your children went through, you know, and thank God that you are the stable one in their life that, you know, can help them through this. Cause it just, everything you're describing about him from what I've, I, I fortunately in my narcissistic relationships, I, I didn't, my late, my husband, my second husband passed away, the narcissist, the full on narcissist. So I didn't go through a divorce, but I have heard, and I've had friends who've experienced this this behavior. And I don't know how they do it, <clears throat> but they're able to turn this stuff around against you and get convince other people that, you know, you're the crazy one and not them. Mm -hmm. they're, they, they've had a lifetime of, of learning how to do this. The part that you haven't even touched on is the cost, the financial cost this had on you. Cause I can't imagine how much money was spent going to court, just fighting to get to get one little thing, to get Those custody of your children. Was, he had attorneys. I couldn't afford attorneys. Right. So I had to learn, you know, how to go to uh, to court. And it seems every time, oh, I understand how to do a motion. I did it. And they changed the rules. It was not at all like, and you know, in Switzerland, I would, uh, you know, secretary would call me and say, you're going to court tomorrow. And I would arrive and they were giving me a motion. You're supposed to get a motion so you can respond. Right. And it was just constantly on the spot. Right. So, and then and I, you know, the court systems, you were, you were pro bono, so you were representing yourself. Yep. And the court system is supposed to give you more grace than the person <laughs> that has an attorney. Right. I mean, I literally, because they understand yeah. you don't know the laws, you don't know the rules. And so they're supposed to give you, they're hmm. supposed to give you more grace. And in this case, they used it against you. Yeah. And when I was in jail, I had a public defender Oof. who told me I was a, a vicious woman who did not obey her husband. Oh my goodness. So not much help from there. 
how in the world did you make it through all this? I am serious because I'm sitting here. I'm getting like <laughs> my heart. I'm just, my heart just melts for you. I mean, how I can't even imagine going through one part of this. But this whole story, it just gets worse and worse and worse. How in the world did you make it through this? I don't know. The grace of God, you know, when yeah. you go through something, there, there's got to be some grace. I had some techniques that I, I was able to, you know, help me. I don't know. I spent four months in a jail in, uh, oh, in Las Vegas, and then two months in California. And the jail in Las Vegas, the inmates were protecting me. They understood oh. that I did not belong there. And, you know, because of the cancer and different health problem, I was on a special diet. You don't get a special diet in jail. No, no, you know they what don't care. Eating. It's like 1,200 calories for $1.50. So I started to eat and I would get so sick. Mm -hmm. So the only thing I ate were oranges. And then uh, from the commissary, I got the uh, rancid sunflowers. And I lived on that for 14 weeks. And the inmate would hide their oranges and they'd give it to me. And if the guard would find them, I had to put all the oranges in the trash and they were punished and were locked in their uh, cell for two days. And, but you know, they, they knew they protected me. And then one time one of the gang member came and told me, do you realize you the alpha female here? Everybody's respecting you. So and I never had problem with the inmate and just being who I was. So sometimes it's not doing something. You know, I thought maybe God put me there so I could help these girls. Yeah. They want to help. They just help each other to not get caught the next time. But just being who I was, I was in my corner reading. And, you know, if they had pain, I would do some, you know, uh, craniosacral. And, and I, for the three first months, I was frantic. I would write to, I, you know, the presidents of Switzerland knew me, the... Uh, I don't blame all you. Kind of, all kind of association. I would just write, write, write. And after three months, it seems I became a zombie. I was always wondering, you know, how do people stay in jail? It's because all of a sudden your brain turns into a zombie and you know, just, you go through the motions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you kind of throw, yeah, you just kind of give up. I mean, it's... I wrote so many things. My kids, uh, you know, wrote letters. My uncle went to the United Nations trying to get some justice and they could do nothing. And there was an, another gal when I was in uh, California in the jail. If I remember well, she had thrown gasoline on her husband and child and was going to light it. So she had to wear red clothes. That means she was a dangerous one. When she went out of her cell, she was handcuffed and, uh, you know, leg cuffed and stuff. When they needed room in the jail, they let her go instead of me. Somebody's being paid off in this one. I'm sorry. There's just some shady, shady, shady stuff going on. There's too many. There's too many things. It's not like there's one yeah, or two. There's too many. If I, had, if I had found the right attorney the judges and the DA would have faced like 15 to 25 years of uh, prison. I, I didn't tell you when you are in jail in one state and they want to move you in another state, they have to ask permission of the governors and the attorney generals of both states for permission to move a prisoner. And they lied. They said they had proof that I had physically gone to California to, kept, to uh, kidnap my children. I have that in black and white. So the DA and the judge lied to the two governors and the two attorney generals. You still can't go after them? Could you go after them now? I don't know. When the attorney general changed in, uh, in Nevada, I went to her and asked her, you know, can we do something about it? Say, oh, that's all archived. I don't deal with old cases. Yeah, there's not enough in it for her. No, you know, and there was not enough money. And who goes against judges? That's a problem. Well, and the thing is, the end goal, I'm sure, in 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 doing something like going after the judges and the DA and stuff, is to change the system so that this type of stuff doesn't happen again. To expose what really truly happened, expose your ex husband and all his cohorts, um, and 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 change no, the system. I don't system. have a problem with my ex husband because he had a horrible childhood. So his I'm sure. brain, you know, yeah. got like that. The problem I've had was the judges because they 
they knew what they were doing. He didn't. He was just, unfortunately, he was damaged from his childhood. Right, right. But not the judges. The judges consciously knew what they were doing. Right, right. They are, They were. They knew they were doing wrong. They were put in these positions of trust. And um, yeah, they were flat out going against the laws and the rules. Yeah. You know, I <sighs> work with different organization changing the laws, but the judge don't follow the laws. So what's the point? Right. Right, right. If they, you know, then you have to appeal it. So that's more time, more money, more stress. Well, was, yes, that's something I was going to say. When I went to the, the court of appeal, uh, they had taken, uh, what is it? It was not audio. Okay. They had audio of my witnesses and one was Karen Huffer and the other was another attorney. And they lost them. They had technical uh, problems, so I couldn't give them to the court of appeal. Therefore, the appeal could not go forth. And all kinds yeah. of things like that. There's just too many things. There's there's just too many dots that connect that tell me that there's so much more behind the scenes than what you know, obviously. Yeah, so, you know... So you, you help people get through this kind of trauma, right? So you help, you help women. People who have PTSD. I have a client, she's a veteran and uh, she uh, experienced incest when she was a kid. Mm -hmm. Then she had a car accident, was in a coma for like a month. Uh, then she became a, she ran away, became a ward of the court. She went into the military. She was raped. So we are you know, getting her life back. They were going to put her in an institution with a tutor. And now she's doing quite well. She's saving money to buy a house and she wants to become a paralegal. Nice. So even, you know, bad trauma, we can repair them. Right. I mean, that's so, what's, that's what's, that is what I find so hopeful is that we can heal from this trauma. We can learn to manage it and it won't manage us anymore. And, um, you know, we can't change what, happened to us in the past, but it doesn't mean it has to define our future, you know, our present exactly. or our future. So, so you, so you help people walk through this and then how do you help? Cause you were mentioning, you know, you help people heal afterwards and, you know, heal from going through this traumatic experience. Mm -hmm. How did you do that for yourself? And how do you do that for others? What did you do for I yourself? Do something for myself because I had the when my colleagues were psychologists and as I was going through all these trials with the court, they asked me to stop talking about it because they couldn't take it. And I met other women who were going through that and say, that's yeah. the same thing. We can't have help from a psychologist, psychiatrist, because they get sick hearing what's happening to us. And they have to go to a psychologist who is trained in legal abuse in, you know, the, all the stuff that's going in, in politics and stuff. That's not mm -hmm. what a psychologist is trained into. So I read a lot of books and, uh, you know, learn one therapy after another. I had a couple of therapists I took who knew about legal abuse, like Karen Huffer. I remember calling her and says, I, you know, she calls that being beyond rage. You, the problem yeah. is when you go through that, you don't have the words to explain. So she called it beyond rage. Yeah. I would call her and say, Hey, Karen, I got another motion and I'm beyond rage. And, you know, we would talk and then she had uh, a kind of therapy. I was doing different therapies and that's how we had the support group. And with the therapies we were using, when you help others, it helps you as well. Yes. So well, True. Uh, you know, and people can tell me all kind of stuff. I can keep my distance so I can help them. As if you're not trained with that and you take it on you mm -hmm. and you have a tendency to get sick or, you know, nightmares. And when I got out of jail, I had nightmares and I found uh, some binaural beats that I would put for an hour uh, before I fell asleep. And that took care of the nightmares. And, you know, little by little, I, I found what helped me. It's baby steps, right? It's baby step. And they say you never get out of PTSD. And in some way, it's true. You can, you know, all of a sudden be triggered by something, but then yeah. you can learn the techniques to not be triggered. Right. So the last time I was triggered was during uh, the COVID situation. I went to the store and I saw people that were waiting one, you know, six feet apart uh, in front of the store. And that brought me back to jail because 
uh, going from the the jail to the court, you had to go in those long hallways, and we were all attached by our uh, our waist one to the other. We had our feet shackled, our hands shackled, and it was those lines of people like six feet apart going through these tunnels, hundreds of people. And I saw that in front of the store, and my heart went into you know mm-hmm. beating hard. So I went back home. And use some of those techniques and just calm down. And then that doesn't show up any longer. So, you know, who knows? Uh, one of the first time I was triggered after jail was because I got in a place where I was tired the same way I had been in jail. You oh, don't yeah. sleep in jail. They have so much noise and light. You always kind of... And I was, I think I was moving or whatever. I hadn't slept much. And all of a sudden, I was back in that jail. Mm-hmm. So you can be triggered by light with uh, one time was in a restaurant where the seating arrangement was kind of the same as in our lunch room. So I just moved and then, you know, did my techniques on that and then doesn't, you know, but you have to do it. You know, you could be triggered, but eventually it's, it's years between triggers and then you know mm-hmm. what to do and it's, it's not such a big deal any longer. Yeah. And the, and the biggest thing I think is recognizing when you're triggered and recognizing that you're in a trigger because, you know, when I think about, I now recognize when I'm being triggered, I, I, I recognize it, but for years I didn't. And I reacted, you know, as a result of it and not realizing, I, I can remember thinking at the time, why do I feel like this? Like, I don't, I felt like I was out of control you know, but I didn't understand I was being triggered. And then my response was very unhealthy and, and, and hurtful usually. <clears throat> but I saw that a couple of months ago, because I very seldom do I get angry, but if I get angry, it goes from zero to a hundred. Like, yeah. Whoosh. Yeah. Yep. It's not gradual. And I don't like incompetence. And I think must have something to do with the jail. <laughs> Sounds <laughs> like me. Judges. <laughs> so I, was, I was at a, a health food store and the cashier was so incompetent and arguing and you know i started to feel really angry and then you know driving back to Jesus, you know why would i get angry so i did again these techniques and i never had that anger again which but, technique yeah, do you use i use a lot of the tapping and imagery and self-hypnosis and i kind of you know yeah mix yeah different things yeah so and you know then, those those are the tools that you have in your toolbox that work for you that when you, <clears throat> when you're feeling triggered or whatever. Yeah. And I had a, a, well, a friend in Las Vegas who also had uh, uh, audios that have frequencies to help with PTSD. So yeah. I listened to that and, you know, there's all kinds of different things I've learned over the years. When I have a problem, I look for a solution and then it goes in my toolbox. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, and that's the benefit. And I talk about all the time in my podcast and that is having the self-awareness because the self-awareness is what's going to head up and head off a lot of the stuff that, you know, I talk about when I didn't have self-awareness, I, I, you know, I created a lot of problems for other people and I had a lot of cleanup to do. And I, I don't like cleaning up. I don't like that. That's not fun. (laughs) It's not fun. It's not, it's not. And sometimes, you know, it ruins relationships. And so, you know, the self-awareness can empower you to catch the triggers, to catch yourself so that you don't do that, so that you don't have the cleanup. Yeah, I tell people it starts with awareness. Then you have to have willingness. You know, ah, there you go. Aware, they don't. You need the willingness. That's when I come with the tools, the strategies, the technique, and then you still have to act on them, and then you have success. Right, right. So what would you tell a person who was in your shoes, like what, you know, what would you tell our listeners that are headed in the direction where you were? Well, when I started in psychology years ago, we were still on the therapist couch for weeks, you know, weeks after weeks for years to maybe figure out why we had a problem. And now we can often resolve a problem in one hour. It's not the painful therapy where you talk and you talk. Mm -hmm. You know, we change the story. We change the wiring in your brain. That's a wiring in your brain that needs to be changed. Correct. And it can get done like that. So it's not those long hours of therapy where you're going to have to relive everything. We don't relive things. We just remove them. Okay? We change the circuitry, uh, circuitry in your brain. And then it's gone. 
Mm -hmm. And we move on to another one and then all of a sudden the whole thing collapses. And you can get to having a meaningful, fulfilling and even a happy life. Yep. And and that's and actually you back and say, How in the world did I do that? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I mean, yeah, because I think about that myself. And that's exactly what I've done is 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 I'm working on rewiring the way I think and you know, it's finding your normal, right? I, I didn't have a normal upbringing. and so you know, one of I the had things... a beautiful childhood. Oh, a that's wonderful. wonderful. Childhood. You know, I grew up in Switzerland. Heidi and Pollyanna were my heroes. So I turned everything, you know, I saw the world with rose colored glasses. I wasn't prepared for what I went through. Yeah. And well, my mom just passed away four months ago. My parents had been married mm. 65 years, never had an argument. And we're talking, I have two brothers and say, yeah. And when we had spouses that argued, we had no clue what to do. Because our parents never argued. They were always happy and we were a happy family. That's true. We so, only we only can do what we know. That's something that I'm realizing. It, so, it sounds kind of crazy, but I have realized really over the last couple, several months is that we do the things that we do because that's what we know. We can't do the things that we don't know, you know, and, and, yeah. and, and that's empowering actually. It helps us understand each other and helps us understand ourselves. Yeah, exactly. When, you know, the people had really messed up were psychologists. They were supposed to be my colleagues. Why did they lie? And the first time I got a report, actually one of my first clients was a woman who had lost custody to a guy who was a known drug addict and uh, uh, he was into alcohol and DUI and he had the custody of a three-year-old. And uh, a client of mine said, you know, can you help this woman? And said, you know, I went back to her and said, I don't know what the judge is seizing her to take the child away. I mean, yes, she's depressed, but what am I missing that the judge sees? Yeah. And six months later, I had the same custody evaluator that made those 13 pages without anything that was true. And I was reading that at my, my client had become a friend and I was reading, say, and I told her, you know, if that's the type of mother I am, he should have custody. And she took me and shook me and said, it's not you. It's a system. And uh, yeah, you know, another custody evaluator said, uh, yeah, the father is abusive. He, I don't know if he said about beating them, but he removes everything that they like. He, for, you know, doesn't allow to do things and, uh, you know, keep them, doesn't feed them right. But the mother is dangerous. She is baking her own bread and feeding them organic food. There's no logic. Alienating the children. Yeah. And, and you read that, that, that report and say, what in the world is he talking about? How can you think like that? How can you be so, have such a different mind like that? I don't understand that. I don't understand how you can. They also have been brainwashed. You know, there is some powerful organization. Yeah. Actually, yeah. it was funny because we went to his office and I I don't remember if I had the seven children, but he had already talked to me and then to a couple of kids. And then all of a sudden he comes out running to his secretary to say, I have a headache. I need something. Because <laughs> my kids, you know, they were homeschooled. They, they spoke their mind. Good. And they told him, you know, what was happening with the father. But you're right. It's amazing how he can twist their mind. Like my youngest daughter, she's in her 30s now. And she contacted me, said she had contacted her father because she wanted to know the other side. And, mm. he, you know, she said, I mean, he loved, he loved you and he still loves you so much. It was the love of his life. Like, mom, why in the world did you divorce? And I have so many letters from her, how he was abusive toward her. And now all of a sudden I'm the bad one because I divorced a guy who loves me so much. It's, I'm telling you, narcissists have an amazing yep. talent of doing that. You know, and if they only use that for good. <laughs> he had so much energy in his hand. He could have been a healer. It was amazing. Oh, my, but, uh, my, my late husband too. He was, he was very intelligent. He mm -hmm. was very talented with his hands. He could build things that were just amazing. You know, I, I saw, there were times I saw his real heart. 
Um, it mm-hmm. was just, he didn't expose that very often. Um, and I know that his story was he too was abused as a child, but that behavior that they have, cause he accused me of, I mean, my, my story is nothing compared to yours at all. I mean, I only was married to him for a year and a half and he was, there were red, a, a couple little, I wouldn't even say red flags, yellow flags before we got married. And I went against my intuition, but it was mm-hmm. after we got married when he really showed his true colors. But the crazy, excuse my French, shit that he would accuse me of, it, it, it was just, he accused me, I mean, he accused me of, one of the things he accused me of uh, borrowing, I, I asked to borrow $20,000. And I, I, I would remember if I ever asked to borrow $20,000. I couldn't figure out for the longest time, it took me months to figure out where he got that number from. Because that's this very specific number, right? Very I think specific. I was of having made $6 million. Yeah. Something like that. Well, I figured out where he got, it took me a few months. This is crazy. It took me a few months because that, that figure stuck out to me. I'm like, why did, why is that number? So I remember I was supposed to be getting a settlement. And what I had said to him, uh, when I get my settlement, I'm going to give you $20,000 to put into the house so we can change out the windows, you know, make it more efficient. I was telling him what we could use the money for. He, that's how far he twisted that. He took that story later on and then started, you know, accusing me, well, you know, when you wanted to borrow $20,000, what are you talking about? And they would get that weird smile on his face. What are you talking about? But I had healed enough. I had enough healing in me and I already lived in a marriage that was, um, really unhealthy that I saw that this, I didn't understand he was a narcissist. I just knew it was crazy behavior. And I just knew I couldn't be around it. I was not doing this. I have never been accused of crazy shit that he, like what he was accusing me of, you know, and, and not trusting me. And, you know, I, I, I'd had enough. So I was getting out and my situation would have been nothing like yours. But until you have lived in that type of relationship, you have no idea. Divorce people tell you, well, you know, you really should get to get, you should get along for the good of the children. You're okay. you you're getting along. He's not. You're the one that's trying to make you guys get along or try to work with him. That's the thing. People don't understand. And they're so yeah. good at hiding it to where only you see it. Only mm-hmm. you oh, see yeah. it. And they can manipulate attorneys and judges. I saw it with my friend. She should have won this lawsuit. She had an attorney. He did not. And he won. Yeah, I, I saw that in a case too. He where, won attorney's uh, fees and he didn't have an attorney. How did that happen? I'm serious. She had to pay his <laughs> attorney fees that he had no attorney. Yeah, nothing makes sense. I went to a three-day trial with uh, another lady who was going through the same thing. So the DA knew that he had molested the children and said, but on a technicality, we couldn't go after him. Oh, God. There was two... Uh, child psychologist who had worked with the children said the father molested uh, one of the girls. The brother could hear them through the wall and he testified. And the father got custody. Now she had some uh, visitation. She never got the visitation, so she appealed. I didn't go to the next uh, trial. A friend of mine, we always had somebody with us. And uh, she said it was crazy. The judge was in tears about what the girl you know, what was going on, the judgment was, well, she's so used to being with a father. We cannot <sighs> remove her now. Oh my God. See, we need to educate these judges on what happens it's, with child they abuse have and trauma. The education, like you said, there is something behind. It's so dark. It's so it, yeah, dark. It's dark. You know, the, the children had an attorney. They gave an, you know, she didn't do anything. She told me, yeah, I see there is a lot of abuse, but the judge wants 50 50 custody there is nothing i can do but she contacted my consulate and said she's not going to win because there is a secret society behind like uh, she said the neo-nazi and then my daughter said no it's the uh no she was told was like the ku klux klan and my daughter said that's the neo-nazi and several people told me there is a secret society behind your case uh, yeah it's it, it sounds like it, it makes sense scary. It's you know, very little, scary. It's I'm that little girl who grew up in Switzerland with Heidi and Pollyanna, and now I have neo Nazi after me. Yeah, right, 
right? And the and in the saddest part really of all of this is the children and what they go through and what happens to them. Yep. That's the heartbreaking My part. My kids are doing pretty good except in relationships. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Yeah. It makes sense. It makes sense. Whew. So if our listeners want to reach out to you, if they're struggling with this and they need help, how can they reach out to you? Well, they can you know, go on my website and I give people 20, 30 minutes, sometime more just to chat about what's going on, whether I can help or not, or what resources I have. You know, I, I know some people and uh, just uh, it's daniellejcoaching.com forward slash calendar if you want to talk with me and uh, go from there. And uh, yeah, I hope you're not in a, in a similar case, but I've known. I've, I've heard so too many, many and it, it's validating to know that you're not the crazy one. But right. That's what makes people so scared because if you're the crazy one, they don't, you know, they don't have to be afraid of anything. But if that's a system that's like that, then, uh, you know, it could go after them. It's called cognitive dissonance. They mm -hmm. don't want to know what's going on. Yeah. Yeah. It's frightening. And I don't know. I don't think there's one answer. I think there's several answers to fixing it, but I, I, I don't, I don't know even know where to start. No, because I've seen, you know, they're redoing here in uh, Colorado, getting new laws and stuff, which is what we were doing in California. That was totally worthless. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, you can make all the laws you want, but if the judges aren't going to follow them, that's no, I mean, it, it makes no sense. They're courtroom and they can do whatever they want. I mean, I think we have to keep pressing on because the the answer certainly isn't, well, let's just throw our hands up in the air and just let the system work the way it works, right? No, I, I mean, that, what did I read? I don't remember, 1950s or when the, the court system went from uh, natural law to statutory law, that doesn't make any sense because you're not judge according to facts. Now you judge according to different statutes they had and different mm -hmm. cases, and they don't even look at your case. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, I, I, it's just crazy. I, 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 again, I know the whole court system as well as our whole foster system and the way that the children are, are taken care of needs to be completely revamped. And I don't see anybody, any government official stepping up to try to change that. They're making money with a foster system. Right. You know, right. For many cases like that. And how a man or a woman is being judged is totally different. Mm-hmm. And then, yeah, they would, you know, social services would come impromptu to my home, but for him, they would contact him two days, two days before, so he could fill up the refrigerator, clean the house and everything. Get everything in order. So it looks perfect when they show up. Yeah. It sounds like there, there is definitely in your case, absolutely more going on behind the scenes than what you knew. And you, I, I, you know, I applaud you for being strong and sticking with it because you did have other choices, but you stuck it out as until the end, you know, until you, to, until the kids turned 18 and were on their own. Yep. <sighs> we'll see. Yeah. Yeah. It's been a road. Well, thank you so <laughs> much for, thank you so much for sharing your story and, and, you know, and thank you for, you know, being there to help other women in this situation and they need a support system. That's a really lonely, scary, crazy place to be. And, um, so thank yeah. you for doing that. And, and uh, if they're willing to get some tools now, I, you know, I was going to help a group, but what they want to do is change the judge. And I cannot help with that. I can Ooh, help yeah. you personally to, you know, stay strong, resilient and recover. Right. Right. I mean, that's the thing because in this case, you're so busy. I call it pouring out because you're busy taking care of, you know, trying to get all this taken care of that you can run yourself down and you're not taking care yeah. of yourself. And it's important yeah. that in order to stay strong, you need to take care of yourself as well so that you can be strong and, and, try to be as clear headed as you can. Cause I, I can't even imagine how overwhelming this can be. Yeah. And it's good to have support. Actually, I made a page a few weeks ago, ago about this story. It's called Phoenix on my website. Okay. So, and that's where people can, I, and I wrote a book called, uh, yes, you can recover from PTSD and legal abuse. Ah, I like that. Excellent. Well, Thank you Listener. so much, Lisa.
Thank you. This has been great. And, you know, I know it's, it's, it's not an easy story to talk about. It's, you know, um, I felt, I felt a lot of pain in my heart. It's, it's hard for people to hear it. It is. It is. I mean, that I, and I understand what you're saying because it's the same with me. Like, I feel like I'm, I've recovered, you know, from so much of my abuse and I can share my stories and it doesn't have that same effect on me. But hearing other people's stories, so many times my heart was just like, oh, yeah. So yeah. many times, you know, but, um, you know, listeners, if, if, you know, we'll have all her contact information, if you feel like you need to, to talk about this and, and, and have support, you can reach out to Danielle. And, you know, if you know anybody who's struggling with this, share this with them, share this podcast with them so that we can get the word out there and get the support for, for these parents. Yeah. No, so I've, I've heard cases where a mother's lost custody of their babies horrible thing and that still grips me and that you know we're talking about what that does to the mom but what does that do to the child being separated from their mother yeah then you know the mother cannot nurse any longer she has to pump milk and give it to the father so he could you know, just... and there's a connection when you're nursing your baby i mean i yes. know i yep. connected with my son when i nursed him you know that was really okay. important to me i can't imagine having that taken away that's horrible for both yeah, absolutely. So listeners, share this podcast with anybody you know that may be struggling with this and share this information. So thank you so much again. Well, thank you, Lisa.